Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Eric Herzman, co-founder of Gridless, a Bitcoin mining company using a microgrid model to pursue stranded energy in East Africa. We talk about microgrid economics, mining operations in East Africa, and financing continued expansion. Eric, welcome to The Mining Pod. Super excited for today's conversation. You are not only a longtime listener blessing my audio feed every week by listening to our show, but you are a practitioner building mini grids in Africa. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Great. Well, for those who listened to What Bitcoin Did, you just joined that podcast. You talked a lot about the African Bitcoin scene. Obviously, that is blowing up right now. And there's a lot of different things in terms of mining or lightning, wallets, payments, stuff like that that we could talk about. But this show, Mining Pod, we got to talk about African Bitcoin mining. Uh, we're going to talk about mini grid and what you were doing with Gridless. You guys just did a seed round, or I believe a seed round. Uh, it wasn't a Series A, right? It was a seed round. Yeah, it was a seed round. That's right. A seed round with a few different people. Uh, so that kind of spread the conversation here and talking about how you guys are going to continue building out these different. Uh, small mini sites for mining. And for those who listen uh, to the Web Bitcoin podcast recently, we're going to pick up the conversation from where that one sort of dropped off. And for those who did not listen to it, I encourage you to go back and listen to it and maybe return to this podcast. Uh, we're going, going to really dig into like the mining side of things and talk about all like the nitty gritty nuts and bolts. To start out, Eric, I just want to talk about the mini grid economics. That was something that you and Peter talked about a decent amount. Uh, but I want a little bit more information out of you if I can. So I'm thinking about like the cost to get these mini grids online, finding the location for them and keeping it running. My understanding is that you partner with people who have already built these things and you guys aren't necessarily building them yourselves, but just from working with those partners, what are like the aspects you're looking at in order to get uh, a mini grid site online? Yeah, thanks. So, uh, so it's been really interesting. We've been having our um, crash course in energy training this last, you know, year and a half or so. And, uh, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, it's been fun. Uh, and it's also been one of those educational experiences. So when we're dealing with, um, mini grids, we're, we're kind of on the edge of, uh, rural Africa that has the beginnings of electrification and not a great amount of usage yet. So if you think about it, um, you know, there's 1.1 billion people around the world who don't have electricity. 600 million of them are in Africa, so over half. And that means that this continent has the most area still to be electrified, which is a massive opportunity. And um, Bitcoin mining is actually going to pay for that. Bitcoin mining pays for electricity to be pushed further out because the normal consumers in those locations don't actually have the usage and demand yet to, to use it all. And the economies of scale for uh, a mini grid provider can be really, really I guess, upsetting if you're an investor, uh, the, the, there's a tyranny of a small size problem, right? Which is, you know, you can have a, you can have a mini grid, let's say a mini grid hydro is going in and he's going to put in 200 kilowatts. He might, it might cost him about $4,000 per kilowatt to put that in. If he was put in two megawatts, it would cost him about a thousand dollars per kilowatt. And so the difference is pretty stark. Um, but they don't have the demand in that area for that usage and they might not for 10 more years. So they can't really, you know, economically make a, a, a good decision uh, to build that much capacity right off the bat. So they build a small site, they spend a lot of money, and uh, even then they don't have full usage. And so when we show up and they've already built something, which is the ones that most people have heard about, um, they, they're they really excited because they finally have an industrial off-taker who can take a big portion of that energy and make them a more economically sustainable company. Yeah, I think that's something that I've definitely learned more about the last two or three years with Bitcoin mining is the fact that you like need these people who are the anchor tenants for purchasing electricity. And most people don't think about that. Okay, let's dive right into the mining stuff. I appreciate your answer there. There's so much that goes into building a mining site. Like I'm thinking about hardware, I'm thinking about repairs, finding technicians or training technicians to control these machines. And then there's like buying the containers, making sure the container has all the right electrical parts. You don't want these things to explode or catch on fire plugging it into the system, making sure it works with the energy grid. Like there's so much that goes into these things. Uh, I want us to get like the whole picture of how you guys set up one of these mini grids. So maybe we can start with the containers and sort of work 
backwards or maybe forwards, I guess, depending on how you think about it, all the way to the machines. Well, actually, let's start in the beginning, um, which is we hear about a mini grid site and um, we need to go and check it out. And so, you know, we just set up a new one in southern Malawi about three or four weeks ago. Um, now we had to go check it out to make sure, it, you know, what, what it was set up like. Could we get three phase power directly from uh, the powerhouse and, uh, and check out the capacity that they had available? Um, check the security of the site location, make sure that we, we could get connectivity in that location as well, and then go in and set it up. Now, so that's the phase one is just doing an assessment. Phase two is, is how do you import different items into a country? Uh, how do you make sure you have all the components there? Um, you know, we have a little checklist now because, you know, you know, if you don't show up with an ethernet cable. You don't necessarily have a place to get Ethernet cable from that isn't three or four hour on a drive away, right? So you have to you have to make sure you're prepared for all of the different contingencies that could happen. So you have to import the the miners in uh, their computers. So that's actually fairly easy in most countries. They're they're going into a data center, so they just file alongside normal computers going into a data center, and. Um, and then you have to make sure you have the connectivity hardware as well. Sometimes that's not available in country. And, um, and once it's all staged, then you, then you do your build. And the build is, um, you know, like in the one in Malawi is fairly small. It's 50 kilowatts. Uh, we didn't want to do too large of a build as we got used to, to working in a new country, making sure we could get our operations right. But we go in there, it takes, you know, maybe a, a day or two to get everything set up and, um, and running. And then along the way, you have all kinds of issues. Um, whether it's, um, wh whether it's, you know, something falling and breaking and you having to fix it on the spot, um, training some people on, on how to do first layer support, uh, whether it's hardware or software, just moving things around, there's all kinds of little things you got to do along the way. And then once it's actually running, maintaining it, um, and making sure that you can manage it remotely as well. Um, I do have to give a shout out to Foreman here. We use Foreman for a lot of our stuff. They have uh, made our lives so much easier. Yeah, Foreman's awesome. I, I used it for my mini home mine last year. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to keep it online because the, the the cost of Bitcoin went down or price of Bitcoin went down. But shout out to Foreman on that one. We're having them on the podcast pretty soon here. Once again, I want to ask a little bit more in-depth questions about uh, like the hardware, like importation, and then like getting parts and stuff like that into the site. What are those lines like for most people in the US or in Western Europe who are like listening to this podcast? Like the they normally go through a distributor of some sort if they're a larger size uh, and if they're a smaller size, they're probably finding some sort of retail outlet in order to like buy their machines or buy their parts. It's fairly established. Like even there's, there's some dodgy players out there on Telegram, things like that you want to stay away from. But I, I got to imagine like the whole system is very different uh, in Africa or East Africa. So there's no mining, mining distributors here in Africa. Um, you know, <laughs> we buy them to, from China, Europe or the U.S where we would find the best deal. Um, we're very fortunate to have some people on our, on our investment or advisory side that know people and can actually connect us and help us not, uh, step on a landmine somewhere, uh, with, with the wrong partner. Um, we've been fortunate to, to get miners at low cost. The, the time we got our capital in and the prices of miners has been fantastic. So anyway, we've been fortunate on that side. Um, you have to know a little bit of our history though, to understand how we can do that, which is, um, we built a hardware company uh, in Africa before where we did everything from the circuit boards to the mechanicals to the cloud stack and the operating system. So we, we, we know quite a bit about how to get hardware into Africa and deploy it as infrastructure. And so we're able to manage that supply chain line uh, where I think it might be more difficult for others. Um, and, um, and then manage the going through customs, going through the revenue authorities in different countries, knowing how to code it properly. So we, we actually have that, that muscle already, which makes it possible. I think for new parties who are just trying to do it, um, if you don't have the right partner on the ground, you could probably have a lot of headaches and maybe pay two or three times as much as you need to. Is it because like you're like, there's a lot of graft within the systems right now for importations of different parts. Is that like what you're alluding to? So sometimes it's graft. Um, more often it's just rent seeking, uh, taking advantage of, um, of people who don't know how to code things properly, don't know how to go through the right channel to get it approved. Yeah. And so you, if you're importing a container, let's say that's worth $30,000, you might end up spending another 
$30,000 to get it in country. Um, that shouldn't be the case, right? You should be spending maybe another $10,000 to get it in country at most. And, um, and that, that's kind of the, where the difference in operational capacity lies is knowing who to deal with, how to deal with it and, uh, and making sure you're, you're doing it the right way. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Okay. So one other thing, just following up on the same line of conversation here is about the technical workers you need to keep these machines online. I think a lot of people just forget like boards break, PSUs fail. You need to swap these things out and fix them. In terms of like the people on the ground or people you hire, what's it like in order to train people up to be able to fix these machines or do you guys keep people on staff? Uh, what's like the technical prowess of like uh, someone you're able to hire for gridless? Yeah, again, so uh, we have the advantage of having electrical engineers that we've hired in the past that have been part of our team. So we've hired them again in this company. And uh, so we have we have staff on the ground here in Nairobi who can fix anything uh, from PSUs to hash boards. Um, if they're fixable, sometimes they're not. Um, and and we so we can do that kind of that, that full support locally. Uh, that doesn't help us in Malawi, right? So in Malawi, we have to do some, we do basically first layer support training of somebody where they can get in there and uh, assess something. They don't really have the ability to get there in there with a the soldering iron yet, but maybe that will come. I think, I think what we're going to do, and this is early days. So in Kenya, obviously you have the full capacity to fix and do everything we need to uh, operationally to keep things live as long as possible. In other countries, if there's a big enough cluster of usage, uh, we'll train people there to do uh, higher level support. But at the end of the day, um, we have a way of fixing things in Africa because we don't have the ability to replace them as easily. And so that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're used to. Everybody is used to making things live longer because uh, you you can't rely on getting replacement parts uh, very easily. Yeah, a little more scrappy. I like that. Uh, same same topic here. Electrical equipment. I'm thinking of like breaker boards, things that are going to go into the containers. In the U.S., you have like a lot of UL stuff, right, where like you'll buy a container from one company and they didn't do things correctly. It's not to spec. And then the local inspector comes out and then puts red tape across your container and you're, you're basically screwed until you get things fixed. Is that present in Africa at all where you have like different, uh, or at least in East Africa, I should say, uh, is there inspections on these sort of equipment or do you guys have to keep up things up to spec or is it basically based on how you guys uh, want to run your own operations? So I'm smiling because technically there's a technically correct answer, um, but yeah. that's not the real that, that, that's not realistically what happens on the ground. Um, so we like to have standardization across all of our electronics because it means that we have less uh, well less different parts, um, less different training, all these different things. So like we only use what's minor, um, <laughs> and the reason why is that way we can be trained completely on how to use those properly and not have to have people using you know. Bitmain over here and, and what's mine over there. That's one thing. But even the containers, uh, we're, we're working on standardizing, right? So right now we have two different types. We're going to be standardizing to one type so that we don't have that, that issue too in the same, in the same way. The final level, which is what you were actually asking is, you know, what's the quality level and the controls in, you know, in the regulator to, to deal with that. So there's, um, let's say it, it might or might not be as high. Uh, of a level of compliance needed in in Africa as in other parts of the world, um, and there might be inspectors who come through. And you you know we actually try and keep all of our stuff at a high level because we want to be reliable for our own selves. But um, yeah, there's uh, it's Africa. There's always a way to make something happen, and so mm -hmm. um, you know you just don't to get shut down like that. It would probably be because there's more of a political problem than there is a. Um, uh, you know, a problem with your actual hardware on the ground. Gotcha. Yeah. Just to defend myself, asking that question a little bit. The reason is like, there's a lot of containers, obviously in the U S and they're across different jurisdictions on the state level, the county level. And I've heard just a lot of stories of different container manufacturers being able to cut corners. And, and there's other manufacturers out here who really tout the fact that like they're UL certified and that everything's up to spec and they have mm -hmm. the best parts. But, like, maybe they only even buy U S manufactured parts. That's a big. Uh, line I hear from container manufacturers, like we're better than everyone else because we have better equipment. And I think it's an important thing going into a bear market and more regulators being understanding of the space. Uh, so if you get shut down during a bear market, like you're really in a, in a pickle because there's not a lot of free capital floating around to keep you up. Uh, and I think at the same time, it's happening more often because 
regulators are more cognizant of Bitcoin mining currently. Uh, let's turn over to the financing side of this and talk about the cost. So again, I'm, I'll show you with Peter. You guys talked about the cost per kilowatt hour for these mini grids. And you said that up to 100 cents per kilowatt hour in some cases, where the more nominal case maybe in like a city would be like 35 cents per kilowatt hour. And then for mining Bitcoin, you guys were able to lower the cost per kilowatt hour down to like 22 cents by adding like that anchor tenant of energy usage with Bitcoin mining. It's still really high, right? So it's it's really tough for a Bitcoin miner to um, eke out a profit there. Uh, if I'm looking at it on paper, like most Bitcoin miners here in the States, like 10 cents is sort of capping out. Even as a home miner, you might go like 11 to 12 cents. But want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe my math is off in some way, but want to get your thoughts. Well, I can tell you we're not paying 22 cents a kilowatt to mine. Um, that would be, yeah, I mean, that would be um, very uneconomical for us. No, so we we walk in and we do uh, uh, revenue share deals with a mini, with a mining company. Uh, so they, gotcha. they make Bitcoin as well. And then they um, they sell it if they want to. They hold it if they want to. We we do some education on on, on it for them. Uh, but ultimately it's their decision on what they want to do. Uh, because if we, and actually this is, this is maybe really one of the more important parts about why I think the, the growth in Bitcoin mining in Africa will only continue is because you have these stranded energy pockets where, um, you know, the, the, the energy is siloed. It doesn't transport well, it doesn't store well, and people are just stuck and they don't have any other options. So if you can come in there and you can make the economic uh, argument for them or with them and show them how that partnership can work out. They're very, very open to it. We haven't had a single party not interested in this, um, because yeah. something is better than nothing. And, um, we always tell them if you can sell this to anybody else, please do. Um, we think it's a better, you know, if there's somebody who's willing to pay more then then definitely take that money. We don't sign these long 25 year PPAs, uh, for that very reason. There's, you know, um, we have written into our contracts very easy outs uh, for them in case there's somebody else who wants to spend more money for that for that energy. Mm -hmm. um, no, but it's important to understand too because there's yeah. this, there's this vast amount of stranded energy already in Africa. Where you're talking, you know, like in Kenya alone, we know there's 200 to 300 co uh, megawatts in just Kenya of stranded renewable energy. Um, that's not counting, you know, the gigawatts that are coming online in Ethiopia. The hundreds of megawatts that are coming online in Uganda. Uh, you know, there's different countries that have just massive amounts of both large, large scale, uh, energy, as well as just lots of mini grids and, um, and those mini grids, um, and, and larger sites all need it. And so, uh, we think that of course we're not objective about this, right? But we think that a lot of mining, uh, will come to Africa because the economics of it make more sense than they do in the US or Europe or even parts of Asia. Yeah, let's take a little detour here for a second and talk about like the energy types. I know you guys talked about this with, with Peter a little bit. The one thing that stood out to me was like, there's a lot of geothermal energy, or at least my understanding is just, there's a lot of geothermal energy in East Africa. Uh, and then there's lots of renewable sources as well that include geothermal, obviously. Tell me a little bit about like finding those energy sources, plopping down like the ability to generate energy directly from that and then integrating Bitcoin mining into it. Before we start recording, you even mentioned like a few projects you know of where they're they're building like Texas sized Bitcoin mines out there. There's some there's some large energy available in Ethiopia right now. Um Uganda is coming online with a lot as well. And um that's all hydro for both of those. And they are gonna be massive. And there's already large miners who are speaking to them. Um it has a certain amount of, of either geographic or political risk that you have to deal with. But if you have the appetite for it, then you can actually make some really good deals happen there. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's really good, ge uh, you know, in East Africa alone, we have great geothermal, um, great hydro, and then some of the best wind and solar also in the world. So wind and solar don't make as much sense, um, unless there may be there's a hybrid model where they're added together. We have some of the best wind here in Northern Kenya, but it's, it's really blows well in the evening. It's something like 300 megawatts of wind. It's fantastic. Uh, and then they have to transport it all the way down to the more populated regions of the country. Uh, you marry that with some solar and some really magical things can happen. Love that. Thanks for that little explanation there. 
Let's go back into grid list and talk about like some frustrations, some aspiration, things you want to see. Every Bitcoin miner has like their story of troubles. I feel like every day there's actually a new one, honestly, uh, that you just like can't <laughs> quite get away from. What are some things that you guys have like come up against in the, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been about a year or two that you guys have been like working on this project? Yeah. I mean, the biggest one for us so far has been um, acts of God, right? Like um, not of rain. Uh, so in East Africa, we've had less rain uh, in the rainy season in November than we were expecting. And we're already seeing a, a drought, um, the least amount of rain they said in 40 years. So that drought is actually already affecting crops and cattle and will continue until the rains come. The rains are supposed to come in April, but they're actually expected now to come in May. So, you know, our hydro sites are operating in non-full capacity because of that. And that's, you know, that's uh, disappointing and frustrating. And there's not a whole lot you can do because you can't add water to the river. Um, however, the, you know, what happens is usually when there's a lot of rain in East Africa, there's lot, not as much in Southern Africa and vice versa. So that means that our sites in Malawi and we're looking at another country down there, um, there's plenty of rain and plenty of water and everything's working great. Uh, so just, I think part for us, it's trying to figure out how to plan for those, those literal low water marks, um, as well as, as making sure that we have a good enough geographic spread to be able to handle it so that if one area is not as optimal as it should be, that we can, we can carry it with some of the others, you know, some other site in some other country. Um, so that's, that's one issue we've dealt with. Um, another issue we had was, you know, in, in one site, we had to put a, uh, communications relay in now our background is telecommunications infrastructure. So something we know quite a lot about, so that wasn't a problem. We put it up, we actually put it up on the power pole solar panel <clears throat> with a storage, uh, with battery storage that would connect to a, um, so a 4g tower, uh, a few miles away, and then a Wi-Fi um, over there, a link down to the mining site. And, um, somebody came in at night, cut the power pole down and, um, stole the battery and, uh, oh. like, okay. Um, <laughs> so you just, you go down all of a sudden you're, you're wondering why, why is your site down? You have no, you have no clue why everybody in that community lost power too, because it was a power pole that was cut down. Yeah. And, um, and you just have to deal with it, right? You just have to get somebody out there, you know, the power company, uh, our mini grid partner is out there fixing the power line. Um, and then we're trying to figure out how to get our connection back up. And, um, it's just something you gotta, you gotta learn to deal with. It's not, it's not the same type of problem that you would have, you know, sitting in Texas, um, mm -hmm. as we have, here. but again, I, I guess you have different problems when you're in Texas than you do in, in Kenya as well. Yeah. It seems to be like more winter freezing hell storms in Texas than, uh, power poles being cut down. Same sort of question here. How do you like think about the geographic distribution? Like it, at what point does it become too hard to manage all these sites and in multiple countries and how do you guys sort of think about where you want to spread the business? Yeah. So we're, we're still figuring it out. We're only in two countries right now. We're trying to decide, you know, how many countries we really want to go to. Um, yeah. my preference would be to have somewhere between three and five countries, uh, as a spread, but then cluster pretty tightly in each one so that we can have, um, maintenance and operations, uh, in that cluster that can work and maintain things while we, uh, while we can grow the footprint within that area. And so what I, what I, I don't want to do is have a spread across, you know, 12 or 15 countries right away. Um, we're still making sure we have our operational capacity built up and, you know, our processes are really tight. As you know, this whole business is about operations yeah. and you know, lean company, lean, lean team. So we don't want to have, it's, it's very easy in Africa because, um, human resources aren't as expensive, right? So we could hire a bunch of people, but there's a, there's a false sense of security in that, um, too, right? You, you know, well, it might be a little, it's a, it's less expensive for those people. Um, you can still, um, have too much bloat. So we're trying to yeah. you know, really close and that make sure we don't have too big of a, too big of a team. And like Bitcoin mining is such a technical endeavor. I mean, compared to other stuff in crypto, maybe not as much, but like there's so much tribal knowledge you have to get within Bitcoin mining and knowing about the parts, operations, logistics. I would just imagine that like at a certain point, it wouldn't be very helpful to add, add more people to a team. And that's the biggest problem, you know, with the geographic spread is that most people don't realize this having traveled in Africa, but travel between intra-Africa travel is actually very expensive. So you don't want to have people who are trying to fly all the time all over the continent. 
because that can raise your your cost profile uh, pretty high. And so you 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 want people you definitely want people on the ground who can maintain and organize things, but you don't want to have to do too much um, transportation of people or things between them. You want to really do that all at one time as much as possible uh, to maintain your operational costs. Gotcha. Well, one kind of question I was curious about for security for these sites: How do you guys think about that? Is it basically up to the energy provider? Or- are, are people looking at these like Bitcoin miners and be like, oh, they're nice and shiny. Why not steal a few? I mean, that happens in the U.S. all the time, obviously. Yeah. What about out there? So we, yeah, remember we do, we do a partnership agreement with our, with our power partner. And so they're aligned with us in making sure things are secure. So we're always on site with them inside their fence line, their security guys or our security guys. Mm-hmm. If need be, um, we can add security people, uh, like in the case of our, of our, battery getting, getting, getting stolen off our, our communications pole. Um, that was, uh, about 700 meters away from the site. So it was easy yeah. for people to get access to that and not have the security guys around. Um, but yeah, we choose to, uh, to be on site uh, always so that we don't have as many of those security risks. Gotcha. Yeah. I was just personally curious about that question a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about aspirations as we get close to ending here. Where did things go from here? You already mentioned like you want to move into a few different countries, but what are some, some larger aspirations for gridless? So we're, we're going to, you know, we, we do a lot of mini grid. I mean, basically all we do right now is mini grids. We're going to do a slightly larger sites in the future. Uh, so maybe somewhere, you know, north of two megawatts, five megawatts sites. So a little bit larger, not too large yet, but a little bit larger. Um, we're also thinking about, uh, that, you know, we talked about earlier that kind of tyranny of the of the the size problem for yeah. energy producers, and we think there's something special where you can take the um, maybe we can bring in a fund that allows for quicker funding of larger sites. So if you're going to build to 200 kilowatts, but you knew that in 10 years you were going to need you know 10 megawatts, um, yeah. maybe we can fund you to build two megawatts instead and have a longer uh, view on the mining capacity locally and better economics for ourselves long term in that site as the community grows to that full usage. Uh, and then it's, of course, it's better for the, for the power producer, the, the guy who's actually building the site because they have a better economies of scale on their own, on their own side of it. And, um, and they have the conf- the confidence in knowing that they have a partner who can always fill that gap, uh, over the years ahead of them. Do you guys have a hash rate projection you're trying to get towards, or is it more about like an energy percentage you want to get into, uh, with all these like these mining sites or, or something more on the energy side? Yeah. So, uh, good. So yeah, good question. There's, there's two ways we think about it. There's the intra company just short term is just how many Bitcoin can we make a month? That's, that's the actual okay. number we look for and, um, and growing that number, uh, so that we, we have a significant portion of our, of our own treasury just in that Bitcoin. Uh, and then the second thing is thinking about the energy, uh, problem in Africa and how we can plug into it, take advantage of the gaps in the market so that we have a longer term view on that energy at the lowest possible rate in the world. Uh, and I think that's, what's been missing for most people is there not everybody. I mean, you can see some of the large public miners doing this in the U S and in other parts of the world where they're funding the energy as well. I think that that has to be done pretty much everywhere because I think energy providers will be the Bitcoin miners of the future. I want to leave with uh, one last question before we go, and that's how are people thinking about Bitcoin mining that you're interacting with now? Like maybe locals, maybe people in the energy companies or telecommunications companies you guys work with. Is Bitcoin becoming more tangible to them? Or is this something they've heard about before and now like they're seeing it for the first time? And when I still show people Bitcoin miners here in Colorado, they're like, oh, like I get this now because I'm actually seeing a physical miner. And I think it really plays into a whole narrative a lot of Bitcoin miners are pushing is that once you have Bitcoin mining community, it becomes more real to people. Are you seeing that on the ground where you guys are working? Yeah. So even Bitcoiners here, like there's a, there's a group, um, uh, called Bitcoin Dada that trains women on how to do Bitcoin, you know, trading or buying or just using it in their businesses. And so we'll take our Bitcoin mining machine and our upstream, you know, box over there so they can see it running and uh it's it's just an eye opener right they everybody can kind of get it intellectually but when you see it and you're like and you're explaining it you're bringing stuff up on screen and showing them what's happening in real time it just changes the dynamics of them understanding it 
that's actually why we bought the upstream data black box was so that we could take it to places. We didn't even take it to new power places. And we say, hey, listen, this is what it is. We can set it here for a week and just let it run so you can see what this does. And mm -hmm. um, because, you know, a lot of these guys in the energy space, if they know, if they've heard of Bitcoin maybe, but they don't really even know what it is. Uh, they have no, they have no way to differentiate that between, you know, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. They have no understanding of the difference between any of the crypto um, things happening in the world. And so what we end up doing is training them on that. Like just yesterday, we were at a solar site. 1.5 megawatts stranded solar um, built two years ago had been unable to get a PPA with uh, with the national grid. You know the guy's desperate to sell his energy to somebody. Understands a little bit about Bitcoin, um, yeah, not very much. We spend you know an hour and a half with him, and most of that's explaining how the Bitcoin network works, how it makes money, how he can translate that into you know his Bitcoin into USD if he wants to, uh, those kind of things, and. You know, at the end of it, you say you, you kind of get this aha moment from them and they're like, OK, I get it, you know, and when they can see the Bitcoin miner at the same time and they can understand how the data center might work, then it makes it much more real to them. So, yeah, it's it, here. I think it's even if it, it's maybe even more stark than in the U.S. where you have people coming in and not having ever seen anything like this before physically and be able to see yeah. it and touch it and uh, people get super excited. OK, I lied. One, one, one last question. And uh, you probably know the question already. What's your hash rate projection for the end of this year? So December 31st, 2023, where are we at in terms of network hash rate? Man, I am, I, I, I don't know. I, I hear your guests getting, putting numbers all over the place. <laughs> I am not educated enough to even make a, a guess myself. I hear them say, and I'm like, sure, it could be. And then I hear somebody else <laughs> say, somebody else, yeah, why not? Um, I will say that I think I, I had a conversation with um, a Bitcoiner, um, from the Middle East recently, and there is a metric ton of mining being turned on mm -hmm. in the Middle East people aren't really aware of. And I think that's one of the reasons why the hash rate's going up so high right now, and it will continue to in the future. So um, I th I would actually be on more on the top end of the, of the numbers for the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Highest I've gone so far was a podcast we haven't put out yet, but it was 400 X hash by the end of the year, which we're at 300. So it's Pretty sizable jump, but plausible. I'd probably be plausible. more like 350. Um, I think 350. F maybe 400, but again, I'm not smart enough to know. I, I don't know enough about what everybody is doing, but I'm just saying I'm seeing the amount of uh, capacity of energy out there. And I know that people are willing to sell it fairly inexpensively right now. Um, and I think people are wising up to that. Bitcoin mining is a great hedge against uh a very inefficient currency in our part of the world. And so even IPPs, so independent power producers, are interested in having and holding something be beyond their own currency. You don't want to bet on the Kenya shilling, I can tell you that much. That's a great quick kicker quote to end the show on. Eric, thank you so much for joining Mining Pod. Hopefully speak again with you soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.